Who are you? Who's asking? If I said I, I would be mistaken. <laughs> you got that right. I was walking along the bike path one day and I uh, saw a man who had been here to we talked at one point and I hadn't seen him for quite a while. And uh, as, as we approached each other, he said, who's walking? And I said, nobody. And he laughed and said, nobody here either. So I finally got what you were talking about. <laughs> nobody here either. Yeah. <laughs> or watching this um, the sense of what you're saying <laughs> not just intellectually uh, talking about um, t ancient texts or what has been said in the past um, or what this person this person how, how can we bring the sense of this about I mean like the, the immensity of it because it seems like to me that there, there's a great discovery I, I mean an un uh, a nameless discovery in what you're saying. So again, I'm I'm struck with um, just uh, how through our interaction we can try to bring that to life mm -hmm. and give it life behind it. <laughs> so um, any suggestions? <laughs> sensing uh, direct directly um, we, we've used words in the past like the absolute and God and um, what is and um, it seems like um, <laughs> it seems like this can never we could, we could go over this a million times I could come and sit here night after night for a thousand years, every night I could come back, and it would always be fresh. What we're speaking about, mm -hmm. it couldn't get it. There was there's no time to it, so how could it get old? It, it, um, I remember some someone who went to Nisargadatta's little closet in India, <laughs> and and they said what we're talking about tonight will be talked about in a thousand years, and. 10,000 years, the same. Right. And it was talked about 3,000 years ago. Yeah. And so in what we're talking about, there's no, no time. This is um, a perennial, not even perennial, <laughs> moment by moment um, unfolding. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm open to what, wherever we go with mm -hmm. it. But, um, well, if you want something really immediate, uh, the Zen masters ask you a question and then they say, if you say yes, you get 30 blows, and if you say no, you get 30 blows. So they're pretty immediate about that. <laughs> so they're putting you right where you are, with, <laughs> with no yes and no no. no. Either way you go, you're going to get 30 blows. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
I can't help but feel that what is being transmitted is something we're so scared of. Mm. just to reside in um, in what is. The word nirvana in Sanskrit actually means to snuff out like you would snuff out a candle. Is that the fear? Mm. Mm. It seems fear arises and oh yes, of course. In that um, at least sensation or idea that there's someone or something that's being snuffed snuffed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea of non-existence is, creates some anxiety for most people. That's what we really have to come to terms with is our non-existence. Both, well, in the organism, non non existence of the self, and our e eventual non existence of the organism itself. Death is happening now as we look at each other. I may have said to you before, uh, a friend of mine, Paul Krasner, said that. The central fact of my life is my death. And I think that's that's a good way of putting it. When the central fact of your life is your non existence, then that's the place that these sages are talking about living out of that, that place. But right now it seems like that non-existence has some ener some type of energy. I can just feel it. I mean, mm -hmm. just sitting with you like this. Mm -hmm. Well, non-existence is, is uh, also present in our deep sleep. And you might say there's some kind of energy associated with that in the sense that we continue to have respiration and blood circulation and things of that sort, digestion and so on going on. Mm. And yet there's, well it's nirvana in the sense of everything else being snuffed out. There's no, nothing going on in that state of deep sea. It's a presence. Mm. What they would call in the literature pure presence, mm. pure awareness. So the sages are talking about being asleep while awake, and that's what they're talking about. <laughs> I remember I said to you one night at uh, dinner over at Richard and Deborah's, or something like that, that um, I've begun to realize that there's no difference between waking life and sleeping life. Mm -hmm. It's one life, one presence, inhabits both of those states. Yeah, I like the way that uh, Ramana puts it when he says that our waking state, like right now when we're alert, and our dream state, like when we're in bed at night, but the mind's operating on a different kind of level, that these are superimposed on what would be our deep sleep state. In other words, that this um, presence
presence that the organism exhibits even in deep sleep, he would say is our natural state or our true, true state, true condition. And that the waking state and the dreaming state are superimposed on that. So this moment, our presence, we call pure presence, mm -hmm. that is, it, we could, it appears that we're awake or it appears that we're asleep. Those things are just appearances mm -hmm. that happen within this, this presence <laughs> that we are. Um, and what I've discovered over the years that links this is that this presence that I am is also impersonal. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think as I remember seeing something Ramana said was that, and of course this, this would be obvious from the standpoint of absolute awareness, it would be obvious that even to speak of deep sleep, dream state, or the waking state, waking state, all of those are, are uh, essentially adding names to something which has no name. In other words, we're, we're making distinctions that need not be made even in that case. Hmm. I think that's one of, the, one of the real important things about coming to, to this uh, self-realization is getting over the habit or the impulse to make those distinctions. Yes. Is that, you're saying that um, that knowing mind of ours is so habituated to mm -hmm. making distinctions. Mm -hmm. This and that, mm -hmm. waking, sleeping, mm -hmm. day, night, and all the things that happen. Well, even more pernicious than that, good and bad, right and wrong, better and worse, should and should not. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are really troublesome. Should, or, should or, or me and you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most troublesome one of all. Or me and God for the Christians. Yeah. So what I feel sitting here, that we're just resting in what we are. It seems that when there's a, a resting in that, that um, that knowing knowing mind, or the distinct distinguishing that mind, um, kind of can dissolve <laughs> in some way. Yeah. Well, you know, you, we we want to. We want to be clear that there's nothing wrong with with the distinguishing uh, when it's clear that all that's being done is that doing what it does. Then, then there's no problem with, with whatever arises in the mind. In fact, um, in fact, you even get over the the idea of thinking in terms of a mind. I mean, you know, we have the idea that there's this self and the self has a mind. More distinctions. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the snuffing out that we're talking about really and, and, and the end of the distinctions is also the end of seeing any particular um, phenomenon or condition as better or worse, or right or wrong. Hmm. It seems that just in listening here, a 
if we're listening to what's being said, then there's just, there is, the snuffing out is there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At any moment. Mm. Um, So what is residing right now um, has resided this way without without time and will reside without time. <laughs> I was thinking as you were saying that about um, one of the books about Ramana is titled Be As You Are and Ramana would sometimes say abide as the self. Those two things are actually the same. In other words, abide as the absolute is what he's saying. And if you are to be, you be as you are, you are the absolute. So both those things are actually saying the same thing. Yeah. And this this um, residing, abiding, <laughs> it's unavoidable. Yeah. <laughs> it's what we are. Yeah. To abide, uh, we abide as. That's right. That. It's natural, you know. It's natural. In yeah. Zou Chen, the, the emphasis is uh, the thing they emphasize. Uh, very much is what they call uh, rigpa, which is a another word for, you might say, an empty mind. But what they mean by what they often call a natural mind is a mind that has no fixation. Um, you know, people sometimes read that and have the impression that there's some state of mind that's to be cultivated, mm -hmm. some particular, uh, well, state of mind would be what, what people think of. But what they're talking about is the mind as it is. The mind as it is. Yes, right. What, whatever it is. Whatever it is, whatever is going on, that's what they're talking about. And being basically okay with that, you know not having a problem with, with what's showing up in consciousness. What is it, would you say, that um, allows for one to be um, totally okay? I wouldn't even say conditions that allow that okayness or that abiding in the self. But is there something that um, you would point to right now that um, for people who do feel that there's further to go or that they need to change their mind mm. or that they are trying to reach a state of mind, 
um, what would you point to at the moment? Um, you said you you're in that state now. <laughs> There's no, but um, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, obviously it's the thing that gets stressed the most in these teachings, and that is this sense of separation. In other words, the dualistic perspective. The idea that there's this thing on this hand and, and the other thing on the other hand. Any two or more entities that we conceive of, are that's dualism. And um, so this idea of separation or division uh, is what what these teachings are are saying is the the issue that needs to be looked at because um, the idea is that there's this state of awareness often seen as some special state this is the idea for a particular state yeah. and then there's me so there's this condition that I desire, and there's me desiring it, as if there's two different things going on here. And of course the desiring itself and the me that's doing the desiring is this other <laughs> reality that we're looking for. It's all one unbroken reality. And yet, you know, we're so highly conditioned to the idea that there's a separate entity here, a me here, and not me is everything else. Hmm. And so there's the me that wants something, and whatever it wants, whatever it desires, is seen to be something apart or other than, than that which is doing the desiring. Of course, the teachings are saying there's just one. So, one yeah, and that's the key point is that um, even suffering or sorrow or pain mm -hmm. or what we call illusion or someone who's in a delusional state it's hard i think one of the things is that someone who is suffering or experiencing that um, they're told by the rest of the culture that what the state that they're in is not they, they need to be in another state mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. what they're doing is not right or it's not yeah I, I I don't say to people how are you you know the the idea is basically that you should be in some particular state yeah uh, it's subtly there oh yeah, yeah. how are you mm -hmm. like yeah right like you know you shouldn't be in some way that would be a negative response you should be in some positive condition so yeah it's definitely that so what, what do you say to people? Hmm? What do you say to people? Well, it's just that I, I you know, I, I, I... You look at them. <laughs> you, know, you, know, I, you know, it's just that I, I see that that... To say that, to say how are you, is to suggest that I'm looking for some positive response. I'm not looking for you to say, you know, uh, I expect to die in three minutes or something like that. I expect you to say I'm fine or whatever. Oh. I see, it's something subtle that there's always an attempt to know, in some way to know if it's okay or if it's not okay, or someone's doing well or not well. And there's always this subtle attempt to distinguish, to know, to yeah, touch and, on. Yeah, and, and, and it works on a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. Uh, it's that idea again that there's some kind of a spectrum where there's negative on one hand and positive on the other hand, and we should be constantly moving away from the negative towards the positive. That's mm -hmm. the idea we are enculturated mm -hmm. with. I guess in relation to that, though, is 
when someone is continuously in a negative state, mm -hmm. or continuously in a positive state, mm -hmm. there's some doubting as to whether they're in that state, actually. I mean, I'm just um, exploring my own experience. When someone is, whatever state they're presenting, mm -hmm. I think I'm usually questioning whether they're actually, whether that's actually the state they're in. Mm. Does that make does that make sense? Well, I think where the problem arises is that um, as long as we have an idea that, for example, uh, there's such a thing as happiness, and we have some job description <laughs> for the word, you know, this is what represents happiness. Some job description. <laughs> then, then there will always be. Uh, something that is not that, and therefore there will always be something that's called unhappiness. And of course, we have a job description for unhappiness, with some idea about what that is. So as long as we make those kind of distinctions, we're going to be constantly vacillating back and forth between, we might say, what's desired and what's not desired. If we don't make those kind of distinctions, then, you know, where can the problem arise? See what I'm saying? In yes. other words, if, if we're just present with what's present, whatever it is, and we don't think of it in terms of positive or negative happiness or unhappiness, uh, whatever, all these different things, then uh, where, where's the problem? So it's, it's this, again, separative notions we have about, you know, this on one hand and that on the other hand. Of course, these teachings are talking about transcending that kind of perspective. Because, as you said, be as you are. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. That's there's that no, means. there's nothing that you need to do to be otherwise. That's right. There's, there's, n whatever state you're in. It's really what Krishnamurti meant when he spoke about choiceless awareness. Yes. Being aware of what's present without concern for what's present, without preferring it to be something other than what it is. Hmm. That's why I said before, the, you know, the. The more per pernicious kinds of things that come up with duality are the shoulds and should not. Yeah. Hmm. And we even look around the world and we say this should be, this shouldn't be. <laughs> we look at our you know, when you, when you really see it, it I, I laugh because it's like... Um, it's like a disease that mm -hmm. runs through our, oh, yeah. our, the framework of our society. Disease, all right. Disease. Mm -hmm. It's continuously there. Oh, should, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, should. yeah, yeah. But it's so simple when you see it. It's the, there's nothing complex about that. It's, it seems very... And in a sense, it's communicable. In the sense that we are, you know... Most of us are not raised by what we might call enlightened parents were raised by parents who are mired in duality just like, you know, most everyone else. And so, from the time we're infants, we're conditioned into this me and you, mama, papa, baby, all these different distinctions. And, and you know, that has a practical value. I mean, it's worthwhile to know an alligator from a, from a <laughs> lizard, you know. You're out in the swamp. Um, but, uh, but this is what the teachings are talking about, looking at and seeing through, seeing through the, where these um, distinctions that we make become problematic. Yes. So yeah, it's a disease in the sense that it's um, rampant through the culture and, uh, as I say, communicable in the, in the sense that we are raised in that kind of point of view. Mm -hmm. Most of us live and die without ever really questioning whether there's any other way to relate to what's here.
So again, I started the, the, the talk just saying, how can we give people a sense mm -hmm. of, uh, of non-duality, mm -hmm. of an experience of, of non-duality? Mm -hmm. How um, can we portray that through speaking together? And it's so simple. <laughs> it's right here. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no more that we need to sense it. It doesn't need to be anything other than it is. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know what, I think what you might say made Buddha famous um, to the extent that he's still more or less revered today for the, for the kind of teachings that, uh, that he promulgated, you know, he, he, he recognized, actually from his own experience, but he recognized that everyone who is introduced to this life generally at some point or another finds themselves finds himself suffering mm -hmm. in some form or another. Yes. Physically, psychologically, whatever. And um, so he recognized that, that this is something that touches everyone. I mean, he could sit down in a park and people would gather around and everybody would know what he was talking about when, when he, he talked talk about, about suffering. Exactly. Yes. And then the next thing he would talk about would be desire. Everyone knew what that was. Everybody <laughs> knows desire. Everyone had a taste of that. Yeah. And then he would make a point that there was some connection between yeah. those those two things. Right. So uh, it doesn't take much to have an immediate uh, response to you know, to this matter. All one has to do is recognize, I mean, you know, I, I recognized my own case when, when I had been reading Krishnamurti and he said where there's, where there's a division, there is, um, he didn't say suffering, but he said uh, conflict. And I could look in my own life and see, yes, where there's there. division in my life, there was conflict. Yeah. So obviously, if you're going to end the conflict, you have to end the division. So again, it doesn't it doesn't take much to you know to be cognizant of these matters. Thanks, Ron. Mm -hmm.